All right, we got a lot of material, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, so we're dealing with a problem, which is a global problem. And what we're offering with micromobility is in many ways very familiar to people. You know, we have scooters, we have e-bikes, we have vehicles that are evol evolutions of an existing 100-year-old technology. However, it's so much more. It's a lot of vehicles that we just saw today are brand new in terms of configuration, in terms of uh, form factor, in terms of uh, use cases, and if, in terms of all of the aspects of mobility that we have to consider. But I'm going to talk very quickly, just as a recap of the foundations that underlie this whole idea. Uh, and there's four I'd like to put forward. Urbanization, unbundling, cost reduction, sustainability. Quickly, the data behind this. Urbanization, a centuries-old phenomenon. This is a projection from the United Nations. This is how many people will be on the planet. The blue area represents the number of people in urban environments. That means shorter distances. That means uh, more constrained in terms of real estate for parking and real estate for travel. That's an uh, undeniable trend that's been persistent and, and um, um, well supported. At the same time, more and more people want mobility across the world, low income, medium income, and high income. You see the saturation of transportation options in the high income world. This is old data. Again, you may have seen it before, but you see how the lower income are actually trailing behind, but they're following the same path and it's the same trajectory that everyone else did a century ago. At the same time, urbanization rising, demand for mobility, vehicle population rising. We also have to collapse the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is happening uh, through legislation right now, but it's going to be more and more driven by consumer demand. So keep an eye on that. Second thing, unbundling. Unbundling is the, is the very notion that right now trip distances are distributed in a you know, um, logarithmic fashion. So we have a lot of short trips versus long trips. Uh, and instead of using one vehicle for everything, we're going to see that split up. Just like unbundling happened in computing and communications is going to happen in mobility. This is one of the theses we have. We've been saying it for a while. Small trips, small vehicles, large trips, large vehicles. It's inevitable. I also want to bring up the fact, you know, in the, from the phone space, smartphones are something that we're familiar with. Everyone has. It's taken about 15 years for everyone to get one. Uh, but if you look at the way those are used, it's very similar in terms of se session length and computation time is very much skewed toward the, the short term. And when you compare these two together in terms of looking at the session length versus trip distances, you see the pattern emerge. Trip distances are a way to demonstrate the demand at the low end. And the phone is certainly one of the ways that that has been um, um, evidence in the computing world. Cost reduction, this is somewhat obvious. Um, and people talk about electric cars, but electric cars are actually very expensive. They're more expensive than average cars. Um, and, and that might over time transition, but we're seeing an overall increase in, in, uh, in large vehicle pricing. And we presented this last time in terms of estimations for uh, automobile and then vis-a-vis -vis, uh, micromobility pricing. It's a big difference. Consumers are going to pick up on this and it, it's going to be more and more addressable and affordable. As a result, as other speakers have already mentioned, um, the vehicle count, the unit numbers for micromobility are going to just overwhelm. Uh, they already do actually exceed the uh, electric automobility number, and they're going to just continue accelerating, and that's an ine inevitable um, uh, consequence of, of simply being small. So these are the four foundations. I'm just ru rushing through this because it's, it's, it's all new. You know, it's, you've seen this all before. Um, th the fourth question, though, is related to how do we measure our contribution in the environment? Um, there's a target out there by 2030 and, and 35 and 40 and so on for every uh, type of transport. It has to reduce its, its uh, uh, footprint on the um, emissions. Um, and this is while, while, again, the number of vehicles in use is increasing. So the fleet growth is, is, is it's not just my own prediction. It's a lot of, a lot of in this case, uh, the IEA is predicting the, the number of vehicles reaching 30 billion by 2050. And at the same time, aviation, um, road transport via um, 
trucks and shipping and all of these other contribute to CO2, but the road passenger vehicle miles are actually the ones that are most compressible, the ones that we can squeeze the most out of, given the fact that there's a lot of slack and there's a lot of waste there. So this is, a, you know, the most likely uh, pressure will come uh, on that on that segment. Some objections. We're going to take a while. This is going to take time. Um, SUV and pickups are actually trending in the opposite direction. Many people find that confusing, but it's it's a natural evolution. Actually, it's sort of the, the dying throes of an industry. Um, we also have uh, sw switching over costs from electric to uh, uh, sorry to electric from uh, from internal combustion, and that's going to have some interesting dynamics uh, as we go through this period. However. Overall, the fundamental point is that there's a huge demand out there for, for miles, and this is the 2012 data by region of the world, and that's just going to explode. So we're going to see demand growth for miles, demand growth for vehicles, demand growth for urban solutions as well. Again, nothing new here. I've been telling you about this for a while. Uh, on the supply side, here's another way to think about the, the way the vehicles are categorized in terms of short to long distance. Um, this, if you make the x-axis, uh, logarithmic, you get to see a, a nice uh, Gaussian type curve, and then you put on it in terms of emissions, you know, the gasoline car, the diesel car, the hybrid car, the electric car, and the plug-in hybrid, and all of these are kind of the medians for their impact in terms of distance of travel and impact on the environment. And therefore, you can sort of create a picture of what our automobility occupies in this space. And then you realize that e-automobility is going to be at the low end of that. That's all well and good. Uh, and then you say, okay, this is what we're going to see as a future. But that red line you see there is what we need to be globally on average. That is the emissions that are necessary to meet the 1.5C uh, target, which is very, very uh, soon uh, going to be in force. You might say, well, well, what about transit? Well, 95% of trips are within this box, which compared to the other box is sort of lower, but, you know, and also extends a little bit further. Um, and that does actually drop below the red line, but not entirely. So it's not going to solve the problem entirely. And within that, you also can put all the countries in the world and realize where everyone is. Of course, the United States is at the top. It's in the worst position. It has to be below the red line to meet the target. And again, if you think about, obviously, micromobility, this is where it's at. This is where all the vehicle types are hitting the target in terms of distance of travel and emissions. And then you can see where we are relative to everyone else. And this is, again, this is something we're going to promote and we're going to talk about with policymakers that this is an obvious solution and it's in front of us today. So vehicle mass versus versus uh, travel distances, all of this data, it's nothing new. You've all seen this before. So I'm not here to talk about any of that. I'm going to talk to you about the user interface. Because in order to see adoption and acceleration, as James pointed out earlier today, we need to see consumers take this up. And when you go back and ask in history, what was the thing that enabled the phones, the computer, the internet, all these technologies to get adopted by billions of people in a relatively short amount of time? Everyone points to the user interface. They say it got easier. A PC got a mouse or a trackpad. The phone got a touch, touch screen and it became uh, entirely all screen, actually. There were no more keys, no more, no more typing to be done, essentially. So think about the user phrase of the computer today and what it might become in the future. Now, to do that, I did the simple search. I type future user interface. This is what Google returns. And actually, it's not just one screen. I'm scrolling through exactly what I got on my screen. This is the screen grabs of futuristic user interfaces. I don't expect you to absorb all that. But what's happening is that most of this is essentially what I would say is instrumentation, showing you what's happening on your computer. What will be the user interface of automobility? Surprise, surprise, you do the same thing and you see the same thing. You see beautiful displays of speedometers. You see beautiful displays of distance of travel. You see all of this. Uh, and again, I'm just gonna scroll through the first few pages that appear on screen if you do this Google search. Futuristic user interface of cars very similar to computers in a way. But this is just instrumentation. This is just like asking, how do I show my speedometer in a more clever way or access to my sound uh, uh, you know, entertainment system? 
And if this was the case for computers, really what we're looking at is activity monitor on the Macintosh, which is like how many bits are being transacted, what is the CPU temperature, what is the um, amount of memory I have available, and so on. And so this activity monitor logic pervades both automobility and computing as sort of like this is what we need to give users as information. In other words, let's simplify this. Let's simplify the operation of the computer and make it easier for you to interact with it and see what's happening. But let's ask the question not of those devices, but rather the user interface of the internet. The internet is the communication network that underlies everything we think about today. Well, first of all, the internet, when, how old is it? What was the beginning of it in terms of interface? Well, this is actually a map of the internet in 1982. Yes, it's that far back. In fact, before then, it was late, late, late 1970s. But in 1982, this is the 25th of February, 1982. That happens to be my 14th birthday. This is what the internet looked like back then. At age 14, I didn't have much to do with the internet. But fast forward a few years later, 1986, this is what the internet looked like. And there was a lot more going on, right? This is only a couple of years later. And by then I was a freshman in college. And actually this is me over here, the little purple guy up there. Um, and that's because I was on the internet at age four, uh, at, sorry, at, at freshman in college. This was in 1986. And I was at the university in Massachusetts, cl close to Harvard, and that's where I was able to log in for the first time. So what did the user interface look like in 1986? Well, it looks like this. It's a command line. Actually, this is in 1986. This is October 13th, 2023. This was last week. I got a, a screen grab. This is terminal. You can open it up on any Macintosh with three keys. And what I did is I typed in a command. I said ping asynco.com and I got a response. It was like, how long does it take to get the packets back to and from that one website? And it's still the same. You can get this sort of interface if you want on the internet. It's available to all of us today. And this is what it, all you had available back in 1980s. And back then, if you look up, you know, even into the late 70s, how many hosts were on the internet? The answer is about 100 hosts. This is the graph showing the rise in the number of hosts, the host count for the internet for since, well, 1970s. And we are, as you can see, plateaued now at 1 billion. Notice, of course, this is a log scale. This is, this is from 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000, 10,000, and so on, adding a zero every time you go up one of these lines. And that's what we started with with the internet. And what happened? We had user interfaces which effectively by the 1980s, late 1980s, would allow us to interact with the computer with much more intuitive ways than typing in commands. Um, in fact, this is another autobiographical picture of me. This is me in 1990. I was, I was working in a laboratory at the time, and this was actually my desktop, and a professional photographer took that photograph. And that is um, not faked in any way. That was my day-to-day -day work in 1990. And that was a couple of years before the browser came out. The browser came out within the NCSA Mosaic in 1993, the Netscape Navi Navigator, which made uh, Andreessen famous and wealthy in 1994, and then the Internet Explorer one year later in 1995. And at that moment in time, there were around one million hosts on the Internet. And then the big breakthrough was not just the browser, but the search engine, which wasn't instantaneous, but the search engine came out in the mid 1990s, about 1995. Well, it depends which engine. In this case, Google came out in 1998. And those became the user interface of the internet. It was not quite a command line. It was a little bit more unstructured in terms of what you could write into it. But it was effectively 1998, still typing into a screen. This is how we got around the internet. And this is what it looks like today, 25 years later. This is the user interface that most people have when they think about the internet and is basically typing in a command or typing in a query. And there's a lot of enthusiasm about this user interface, ChatGPT. I typed in what is micromobility in it, and unlike the previous interface, this might actually give me a complete answer which is composed of search results, but done in a very clever way, and it's much more conversational. But this is how far we've come in 50 years of the internet, command line to command line. What's changed is that we are able to now use computer intelligence to determine what we want, to be able to not be so precise. And so I came to this conclusion, vehicle interfaces are instrumentation. 
but network user interfaces are navigation. The browser, the search engine is effectively asking you, where do you want to go? And let me try to get you there or let me redirect you to some other place that you may not have asked for, but we're going to find a way to give you value that way. And in so redirecting you, we're going to get some funding via monetization. And so we come to the question again, what is the internet? What is the end user interface for the uh, micromobility? Well, every app I've ever seen for micromobility, whether it's you know, a device that's shared or not, is basically a map. And what we have here, even for, not just for micromobility, but even for uh, Uber and Lyft, we have Bird, by the way, here we have um, uh, Uber and, and Lyft, and uh, um, I forgot which one uh, is that one in the middle there. But the idea is that we have maps as the fundamental question. And why? Because it's a network. It's trying to help you get to certain places. And that's because all we had was phones. We had phones as we had computers during the early days. And we could discover the internet through the screen. And now we discover trips through our phone, our pocket-sized device. And now Apple, in the last few months, has introduced a new, a new wearable device that's offering something called spatial computing. The idea is that we're no longer bound by the two dimensions. We have suddenly a three-dimensional canvas on which to paint this picture. So then I ask again, what is our interface? What are we going to offer to consumers that's going to say, please come along and experience something different? How do we get people to go from A to B, or maybe to C, even though they, they didn't ask for C? And I propose to you that the answer lies in a wearable device. And I've sort of decided to do a mock-up of this. What would it look like? And so I just filled it. This is, this is me riding a vehicle. Actually, it turns out to be an Apollo vehicle. Thanks for for having that lent to me. Um, and this is in Italy. And this is what it looks like from the writer's point of view. And this is the canvas upon which Michael Modelo paints a picture. He just turned down a little bit the audio there. Now, I grant you that this is a dis different canvas than what we're used to. We're not, re we're not creating an artificial screen we're creating a natural screen but there's very uh, every opportunity to paint on this picture and to create a a a an experience about the journey not so much about the destination not so much about efficiency not about utility but the experience of actually being head up, heads up looking at the world as you're traversing it people getting married Notice I'm on the street, I'm on the sidewalk, it doesn't matter. Micromobility has this flexibility. And so the challenge here is to marry the device with the experience and with the question of like, what do you see and how do you live into uh, a new way of, of uh, encouraging users to look up. I always said that micromobility is about looking up, automobility is about looking down. Automobility is about cocooning someone, separating them from the world. Micromobility is about providing a new way to look at the world. And only, only vehicles of our, in this, in this uh, uh, category provide a lookup experience. Only these vehicles encourage it. Only these, these vehicles have therefore a way to monetize this. The physical world is our user interface. How we paint on that canvas is going to determine this, this whole industry. And it is a computing question. It is a software question. So I, I would encourage anyone who has ambition to think about it as a software question. I come from that world, perhaps I'm biased, but it's not just utility. It's not just efficiency. It's not just dollars per mile or kilometer. It's about experiences. It's about an enlightenment. It's about connectivity with, with the world around you. Does that make sense? Thank you very much.